meeting on, on October 2nd, 2023 at 7.31 p.m. Uh, our first order of business is approval of the meeting minutes. Uh, we are actually going to hold off on this. Um, because we have already approved uh, August 21st meeting minutes. We need to approve September 18th. So, Josh, if we could just carry that over to the next meeting. Yep. Thank you. And thank you, Julie, for uh, making note of that for us. Sorry I didn't do it sooner. But <clears throat> uh, So our next order of business is public comments. Um, if we do have any public comments, I would ask that you state your name and your street address for the public record. Do we have any public comments? Okay, not hearing any uh, public comments. We will move on. Our next order of business is old business. Uh, we do have a guest uh, joining the committee for this evening. Uh, so if there's no objections from the committee, uh, the chair is going to carry over any old business we may have to the next meeting. Okay, not hearing any disagreement with that. We will move on to uh, new business. And our first item of business is Vision to Reality presentation. Uh, I would like to thank our guests for joining us this evening. And I'll jump, let you jump right in. Yes, I'm the guest. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody even knows who I am. I'm Bob well, Whitley. I am the uh, Director of uh, Community and Economic Development for Town of Bridgewater. <clears throat> Join the town on January 9th of this year. I guess the first quiz is does this, how many people are familiar with what vision and reality is? Raise your hands. I know MJ is. MJ has been a constant supporter and we're grateful for that. The rest of you are on notice. Who knows what vision and reality is? Yeah. All right. No, you know, I'm actually, uh, I guess, familiar as somebody can be uh, with it. Uh, I do get the uh, email updates, um, and I, I have read uh, the information that's available online. Right. And so I attended the meeting last week with MJ as well, so right. not as familiar with as she, but I'm familiar. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm not You're familiar. Welcome. I was away. Um, I missed the meeting last week because I was away. I would love to hear more. Great. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here um, as MJ and Julie know, and Nathan is aware, we had a community work. This is a you know, vision of reality is, let me just preface everything I'm going to say tonight. Vision of reality is the culmination of 15 years of planning by the town of Bridgewater. And this is the execution of that planning. Uh, we had a community workshop last Tuesday night at the Mitchell Elementary School. We were hoping for 100 to 125 people to attend. We had 253 people that attended. Um, so in municipal government, that's a good thing. Um, and I think people learned a lot. We learned a lot from people in terms of their comments. But um, so what I wanna do tonight is just kind of take you through the a snapshot of, of what this initiative is and where we're going with it. Um, and I, I guess, I mean, just going to be frank that, you know, this is an initiative that's been going on since January. We have a, probably one of the most comprehensive websites for any kind of project that I'm aware of anywhere in the country. Uh, this is more, most comprehensive revitalization, uh, effort that's going on anywhere in the country. So, um, I, I guess I would implore all of you to get more engaged as the finance committee as to what this is in terms of what it means for the future of Bridgewater. Um, I'll just add a little bit more context. Um, I'm coming back to Bridgewater after a 40 year hiatus. I was an undergraduate at Bridgewater State College in 1977. Um, I was solicited to come back and uh, I think Kimberly reached out to me in November of last year. Um, so I'm coming full circle. So this is where my career started and where it ended. Uh, I chide people all the time that they are in the Guy Clifford house. Guy Clifford was my first uh, advisor. Uh, he allowed me to do an internship at the State House in Boston as a sophomore, which is unprecedented. And that's what started my career in municipal government. So 
without saying much more, I'm going to uh, share with you, if I can, a uh, presentation in terms of what uh, vision reality is. So, uh, as I said, vision reality is the culmination of lots of planning and studies that have been done for the last over a decade in Bridgewater. Um, Good stuff, good planning, but no execution. Um, you know, I was brought here based on my past experience to make sure that we could make some things happen. Uh, this is just a rendering. If you're at all familiar with the uh, Central Square area, this is looking from the old town hall to the east. Uh, what this could look like with some improvements to the roadway, expansion of the sidewalks and um, how these buildings could be improved. So what is vision and reality? All of these elements are what makes up vision and reality. And if you go to the vision and reality website, and if you haven't yet, um, I encourage you to do that. Uh, as I said before, it's probably one of the most comprehensive websites for economic revitalization that a municipality could do. Uh, we have YouTube videos up there. We have white papers up there, we have newsletters up there. Um, but my, one of my observations is that government oftentimes looks at things in straight lines and looks in silos and doesn't look at what the interconnection of different elements are. I think what distinguishes vision reality is all of these elements are interconnected in terms of what this plan is. So are we addressing housing? Yes. Are we addressing transportation? Yes. Pedestrian safety, historic preservation, infrastructure, economic development, small business, job creation. All of these things are part of what vision to reality is. And I think this is really what distinguishes us from any other community and anywhere in this country looking at these types of uh, initiatives. So some of you are, you know, in the business world are familiar with what a SWOT analysis is, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And that's how we've looked at this. We've looked at what the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats in the community are. So the strengths are that we have a very supportive town council and town administration. Uh, earlier this year, the town council adopted a resolution supporting what the vision to reality was all about. Uh, we're building on the past planning efforts in the adoption of the comprehensive master plan last year, and also building off of the strengths that Bridgewater State University brings. So as I said, we've got, in, in my world, in the planning world, economic de development world, we talk about the concept of paralysis by analysis, and we've done a lot of studies but we haven't executed on that. So, you know, just looking back, as I said before, we had adopted a comprehensive master plan last year. We did another comp uh, community development plan in 2014. We have done street prioritization. We have a housing production plan. The Bridgewater State has their institutional strategic plan. Uh, they're gonna up, They're in the process of updating that again, but we haven't done anything. So the weaknesses are some of our existing zoning, the lack of investment in the central business district, and the lack of mixed income housing in the central business district. I will not use the term affordable housing because I think it creates stereotypes and there's misnomers to what that means. I'll show you that in a minute. I prefer to use the term workforce housing or mixed income housing because that's really what we're addressing. So getting to that slide right now. So modern income in, in by HUD standards are people that are making nine, if you're a single individual making $79,000, almost $80,000 a year, you're considered to be moderate income. And if you're a single individual making almost $64,000 a year, you're considered to be low income. If 
you have two family, two people in that household, it's 92,000. Two people in the low income is 72,000, almost 73. In contrast, if you're a first year school teacher in the Bridgewater School, Bridgewater Raynham School District, you're making $52,000 a year. If you're a teacher first year with a master's, you're making almost 60,000. And a first year police officer, makes $60,000 a year. So I, I think when people talk about, and we heard this a lot at the workshop, are you creating all this affordable housing? No, we're creating housing for people that work in this community, that contribute to this community. So I don't think anyone would say that a, a fire professional, a police professional, a teacher is somebody that's low income. Those are people, I mean, we have to educate people in terms of what low income means. And that's a struggle. I, I mean, I've done been doing this for over 30 years, and it's one of my biggest frustrations, uh, the stereotypes that are associated with affordable housing. And affordable housing is based on what's called area median income. The area median income for a family of four in Bridgewater is almost $114,000 a year. That's not an insignificant number. So just looking at what the housing market is in Bridgewater right now, in June of this year, the median, median is half or higher, half or lower, it's not an average. The list price for a home was $650,000 a year. And the sale price was $682,000 a year with an average time of market on 21 days. The average rent is almost 20, 2075, the range is somewhere between 1942 and 3324. And we have a lack of uh, opportunities for both 55 and older housing in the community and mixed income housing for young professionals. The most effective tool that a community has to address housing is, is, is zoning. And we'll talk about that. So what are the opportunities? Bridgewater is one of 177 communities in the Commonwealth identified as being an MBTA community. In 2021, the Commonwealth adopted legislation, uh, Chapter 40, Section 3A, that determined that if you were an MBTA community, you had to create X number of units of new housing that had to be in proximity to uh, MBTA transit assets. Uh, and so we're building upon that. So we are revising our zoning. We're adopting something called a form-based code, and we're going to build upon a uh, program at Bridgewater State, which is their cybersecurity. That's an opportunity as part of the SWAT. So the MBTA community's legislation requires by right zoning to allow us to have 1,401 new housing units we have to designate where that is. We're going to have to create an overlay district. Right now, the uh, platform for the MBTA is in the southeast corridor of the university. Uh, university housing doesn't contribute to that number. There's wetlands to the south. Um, we're looking to relocate the platform back to the Spring Street lot. We've had those conversations with both the university and the MBTA. Uh, we're looking to see where we can do redevelopment in that area. It, this doesn't mean that we have to build 1,401 units. It means we have to have a zoning in place to allow for that. The market will determine whether or not we're going to have to build that many units. But we have to, at least in, in our zoning ordinance, allow for that. This is not subsidized housing. This is not affordable housing. There's no requirement from the state in terms of what type of housing this can be. So the form-based code is a alternative uh, zoning tool that we have uh, that we can allow developers to have an expedited approval process. It's something that the community uh, agrees on. We have received grant money from the governor's office to redo our zoning to meet the MBTA compliance. One of the elements of that is adopting a form-based code. We'll, our next community workshop will be engaging the community in terms of what that is. But in, in essence, what that means is if a developer comes in and says, 
I'm going to check all the boxes that the community has set as priorities in terms of type of building, materials, location, use, that it's an expedited approval process. They're not going to have to ping pong back between the planning board, the zoning board, potentially a town council. It could be done as an administrative review. So that is something that we're, we're working on right now. As I said, that will be our next community workshop. I think the big part of where we see future opportunities for Bridgewater is the cybersecurity program that Bridgewater State University is launching. They've had this as a certificate program for the last several years. Beginning next fall, it's going to be a degree program. Cybersecurity touches all of us now. Uh, in the cybersecurity space, the, the unemployment rate has been zero. Uh, we feel that there's a real opportunity for there to be spinoff jobs coming off of this, industries coming off of this, an opportunity to monetize the intellectual capacity coming out of the university, that we can create a facility off campus that could co-locate uh, technology businesses that are in this space with professors and students coming out of this then there's new businesses that come out of this. This is not only going to benefit Bridgewater, it's going to benefit the region. So there's an economic multiplier associated with that. It's what we refer to as the domino effect. So there's going to be increased student enrollment, opportunities for postgraduate employment, new mixed use development, business expansion and attraction. So as we bring in more people, that creates more economic activity creates more jobs, then you can start to see what the economic uh, domino effect of that is. So what are some of the threats that we see through this SWOT analysis? Yeah, we have some infrastructure capacity issues with respect to water and wastewater. Um, you know, this is a conversation we're having with the Healy administration ongoing. Uh, we've got a listening session with Lieutenant Governor Driscoll tomorrow. Um, it's fine to say that you would like us to create X number of units of housing. And that 1,400 units of housing is based on 15% of what the existing housing in, in Bridgewater is now. That's not a number that the town came up with. That's a number that the Commonwealth came up and said, you have to meet that. Uh, it's not a multiple choice question. We can't opt out of the MBTA community's legislation. There is money available if we do, but the money available is not going to be sufficient enough to meet our infrastructure requirements. So we are continuing to have these conversations with the administration. As an example, right now, we treat wastewater for the university. We'd like to have a conversation about redirecting that wastewater to the Department of Corrections, who has a wastewater treatment plant that is underutilized, that frees up capacity for us. Our frustration, quite honestly, is that on the one hand, the Commonwealth is saying you need to increase this housing, but we also need to increase what our withdrawal permits are from our wells, and we're not able to have that conversation with DEP. So there are a lot of moving pieces to this. This legislation is new. We expect that there's going to be cha changes to it and amendments as we move forward, but I just want you all to know that we're very aware of these things and that the town is engaged in these conversations. As part of the MBTA communities, within a half a mile of wherever a MBTA platform is, is where you have to concentrate a percentage of the new housing. We're looking to say that you know, if we move the MBTA platform back to the Spring Street lot, originally it was where Burger King is. Obviously, that's not going to happen again, but the Spring Street lot is where it needs to be. We have five sites that are really ripe for redevelopment. Campus Plaza is the largest opportunity. That's 13 plus acres. Campus Plaza has looked like this since I was here in 1977. We have a proposal before the planning board right now for Perkins Foundry site for 148 units of, of residential and two mixed use buildings in the front. The Friendlies Assemblage, which everyone I'm sure is aware of on Broad Street, is prime for redevelopment. Uh, we're looking at the corner of Hale and Plymouth Street, which the university owns. Uh, we actually think that initially we thought this could be housing. We think this is the right opportunity for 
that uh, co-business location with the tech in the university. Uh, we think there's an opportunity for some redevelopment in a portion of the Spring Street lot. And then there's also a parcel on Hale Street that is currently a technical recycling site, which means they're doing computer recycling and also means it's a dirty site. So some of the things we're looking at is on Central Square, reducing that to a one lane road in each direction, expanding the sidewalks out, creating it a more pedestrian improvements. Uh, tomorrow, on uh, Thursday night, I'm sorry, uh, the o Old Colony Planning Council has conducted a Route 18 corridor study from East Bridgewater to the Middleborough Rotary. Uh, this is, this. our proposed plan is consistent with their recommending. I can tell you that every intersection in Bridgewater, with the exception of one of the entrances to Campus Plaza, has been rated F. So there's nothing we can do except improve what existing conditions can be. Our timeline is we, as I said, we had the workshop last week. Our hope is that we're gonna have the proposed zoning amendments for the town council in December with a second reading in January. The MBTA community's compliance has to be done by Jan by December of 2024, we're looking to have it done in January 24, so we can be a full year ahead of that. Um, we're doing an ongoing evaluation of water capacity and, and future infrastructure improvements. I think that's the next agenda item, which uh, Lori and I can talk about. Uh, we're in discussions with the Department of Corrections, the state and BSU in terms of the reallocation of the wastewater. Uh, I expect that the Perkins Foundry project will be approved by the fourth quarter of this year. And I think we're going to see something coming forward with respect to the Friendlies assemblage in the second quarter of next year. We're constantly looking at state and federal funding opportunities. And then and the last piece is under state law, we are uh, able to do tax increment financing. Um, we'll look at that. TIF financing is, as an example, I'll just use Campus Plaza. If we were receiving a million dollars in revenue right now from Campus Plaza as tax revenue, and we were to upzone that, and when it was fully built out, we were receiving 30 million in, in payments, exaggerated amount, I agree. We would be able to use that gap of $29 million to fund either infrastructure or other public improvements. We could borrow against that. So that's something that we're looking at. So my whole thing is, you know, what we do is create a there there. So this is just, you know, a architectural rendering of what potentially could happen in an area like Campus Plaza if you had three, four story buildings with public space. I like to refer to it as a miniature Mashpee Commons, but that may or may not sit well with people. But I encourage you, if you haven't been, and I don't know why you haven't, go to the Bridgewater Vision to Reality website. There's an abundance of information there. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions now or offline, but this is really a critical time for the community and something we're very excited about having. So thank you. All right, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Ruley. Um, I, I will open it up uh, to the committee to see if they have any quick questions. We don't wanna take up too much of your time, but that being said, especially for some of our newer members, I'd just like to remind you that right now we are meeting as the finance committee. Um, we're not a group of private citizens, so to speak. Uh, and we're also not the planning board. Uh, so I, I don't wanna get deep in the weeds on zoning or anything like that. So. If we can keep questions, um, you know, in the vein of the of the business of the finance committee, it would be much appreciated. So that being said, do we have any questions? I have one, Mr. Chair. Sure. Through you to Mr. Ruley. Uh, Mr. Ruley, um, thank you for bringing the presentation before us tonight. It was definitely good to have it come before the board tonight. Uh, my question from the finance committee's perspective, um, what do you see probably coming in the next few months for us to potentially uh, work on on that part? Because I know there's most likely going to be a financial, um, there's going to be a financial component to the vision of reality plan. 
and when we start getting things underway, what do you see potentially is coming before the finance committee that we might want to keep an eye out for or be aware that could be coming down the line so we can at least keep our schedule open to uh, to review or uh, consider? Thanks, MJ. Uh, well, I mean, I think the first piece is like agenda item two tonight <laughs> in terms of the, uh, you know, the appropriation for the two additional wells because infrastructure is important. Uh, I, I did a white paper and I've done a series of white papers on the website we call Let's Talk. And I talk about, and one of them talks about what the benefits of what we're doing is in terms of additional revenue to the community. And so I don't think there's going to be an immediate ask of the finance committee uh, in terms of what we're looking for. Uh, I think it's important that you're all aware of what we're doing and what the potential of additional revenue to the town is. But in the short term, you know, looking at uh, dropping two new wells on High Street is something, whether we did vision to reality or not, is something that we need to do. But, you know, the hope is that, you know, through the MBTA communities, there's money available for infrastructure improvements. Through the increase in zoning, we're able to get developer contributions to infrastructure. Um, that's what is going to be in the short term. But I don't see any short term ask other than infrastructure related funding coming before this committee. Okay, thank and you. A follow-up question, question, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if Lori would be okay with answering this question. Is there anything um, that would be tangential to the vision and reality proposal that would be part of our capital plan outside of the wall replacements? Is there anything that we can tie into that at some point? Oh, I'm sure we do some things on the capital coming up for you. Um, so we're working on that right now. So, you know, we know infrastructure like, like Bob as stated is, is going to be key to all this development. So I would just add that, you know, we're taking a 10 year plan and condensing it to a five year plan. Um, because I mean, this is, this is not going to happen next week. There are a lot of moving pieces to this. Um, but the fact that we're able to condense this down is, I think testament to the council and the manager's office supporting what this initiative is. Um, but you know, there's nothing that's going to happen this fiscal year other than what we do with the wells and then perhaps with respect to wastewater, which are things we need to do anyways. But you know, the vision of reality is it's it's an organic process. Can I just um, add to that? Um, no, Lori. Yeah. So, yeah, Bob's right. Like, the infrastructure that will be coming before you is really just infrastructure needs anyway. So, you guys know how the, what the roadway situ situations are and our well and um, that kind of infrastructure stuff, regardless of any kind of development. So, and what Bob is talking about, you know, 10 years out, it's not development that the town's paying for. This is just us giving the tools for all of the businesses and, and companies coming in, you know, so that they can spend their money to, to put their business in Bridgewater and make it successful. Yeah, I, I think, thank you, Lori. I mean, that's a very important point. Uh, the town isn't building anything. The town is enabling this development to happen through the revision of our zoning ordinances to allow more density. Um, I've seen lots of comments in the last month, in the last even since the workshop, that we're creating 1,400 units of affordable housing. That's never been part of the narrative. This is not affordable housing. This is just the Commonwealth saying we need we have a housing crisis in the state. And we need to have a plan to address that. So this could be single family homes. This could be condominiums. This could be townhomes. These are not affordable units. These are not subsidized units. So I think that's important. But to Lori's point, whether we did this or not, 
we have infrastructure improvements that we need to make. So by coordinating this initiative with what our needs are, gives us an opportunity to find additional free money through grants and federal money, as well as developer contributions to make this investment in public improvements, which is infrastructure and public space. Okay, thank you very much. Great uh, questions, MJ. Do we have any other questions? I do. I, I have a question, Great. Mr. Chairman. How we? Um, thank you so much. Um, Bob, thank you for. Um, I was away the last couple last couple of weeks, um, so I apologize and thank you so much for the presentation. I'm really excited about this. Um, I think you began to answer the first part of my question. Um, where you began to say there were a lot of responses. Um, you know, I'm relatively new to Bridgewater. Um, I'm learning that there are different dichotomy that impacts this community, uh, this town. Um, one of which obviously is sort of um old school Bridgewater folks. Um, you know. And I realize that this is not finance related, so I apologize, Mr. Chairman. Maybe it might, I might find a way to frame it into a finance question. Um, but I would love for you, Bob, um, to maybe speak to the different dichotomy or or the challenges that that you that that the town is seeing, and what can perhaps the finance committee do, um, you know, to I don't know educate people as we are you know, um, engaging and interacting with people in town. And the second part of my question is, um, is there a roadmap that the town can share with the finance committee so that for us, you know, we'll have an idea of here's what's to come next, right? And then, um, you know, obviously, you know, developer funds, you know, different source of um, income will fund this um the greater project I, I i um i would imagine but is there a roadmap the roadmap that could be shared with the finance committee um so that we could begin to think about um you know um our positioning um if and when the town does come to us and say hey we need you guys to vote on this from a finance point of view okay for the next three hours, I can talk about this. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, to answer the first part of your question, and I appreciate you you asking that, um, I'm someone that's pretty passionate about what I do, and I get very frustrated when people, you know, stereotype what affordable housing is and, you know, those people. You know, affordable, I mean, I, I shared with you, I mean, so are we going to say somebody that's a first year school teacher in our school district, you know, we shouldn't appreciate that person because that's what they make. I mean, this is the reality of the housing crisis that exists in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts right now. I, I have many criticisms of what the current administration's policies are and Hopefully, I will articulate some of those tomorrow with the lieutenant governor. But we need to acknowledge that you know we are there are people in our community that contribute to our community that shouldn't be stereotyped on what they make and what their income is. I mean, if I look at what income limits are by, and this is determined by the federal government, this is by housing and urban development. Ninety percent of the people that work in Bridgewater Town Hall would fall into those categories. Um, so, I mean, education is a big part of what I do. And I sometimes don't hide my frustration as well as I should, because I'm passionate about this. Um, you know, if someone spends more than 30% of their income on housing, they're considered to be cost burdened. Well, if you're making, you know, as a first year school teacher, you're at like 43% of what your housing is. So, and we have to get people over this 
misconception. I mean, you know, people showed up at the workshop. You're talking about Section 8 housing. Well, Section 8 is a whole different voucher program of affordable housing. And that and I will speak ad nauseum on housing, whoever wants to listen. Um, I, I don't think that, you know, in the short term, we're not going to be coming to this committee looking for funding. We're going to be coming to this committee looking to support what the initiative is and what some of the policies that we want to see come out of this are. That, you know, our goal is to be able to effectuate what the MBTA community's obligations are, how we can change this community, and not do that on the back of current taxpayers. Either have that be through developer contributions, federal or state grant money, and, and other opportunities for funding. Um, you know, some of these issues with respect to infrastructure, as an example, we can't continue to have this be a Bridgewater only conversation. These need to be regional conversations. And if we're going to attract federal funding, it's much better that this be a regional conversation. So um, I think in the short term, this committee and any other committee in town, understanding what vision and reality is, supporting that, offering comments if you feel that there are things that aren't correct about that, and we're welcome to that. I mean, I am not the end all answer to all of this, but I think more importantly is the community understanding where are we going? And status quo is not sustainable. If, if we didn't do vision to reality, we still are gonna need to spend over $50 million in the next several years for wastewater and water improvements. If we can only increase tax revenues by two and a half percent a year, we can't do that. So this is an opportunity to, I think, address many issues at one time and do it in a smart way and in a way that distinguishes us from other communities, not just in the Commonwealth, but in the country in terms of a holistic approach. So I apologize for the long answer to your short questions, but I appreciate the questions. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Thank you, uh, thank you. Mr. Mr. Rooley. Uh, if I could, if I could, do you have another question, Ray? No, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was just saying thank you. I appreciate the response. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, great questions. Great answers. Um, you know, moving on, we do have another special guest for this evening. Uh, but I want to make sure that everybody, if they have a chance for Mr. Rooley while he's here, uh, has a chance to ask a question. Mr. Chair, I actually have a question. Sure. Yeah, go right uh, ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Rooley, I'm really excited about the Vision to Reality project um, as a relatively new resident of Bridgewater. Um, I do just have a few questions when we're talking about, like you were saying, um, financing infrastructure improvements over the next several years. Has there been any analysis on the potential costs of new development in terms of increased pressure on water systems, wastewater treatment? increased number of children attending school that might require more school teachers to be hired, et cetera. Like, have there been any even estimates or analyses on that? Sure. I mean, two separate questions in terms of infrastructure. I mean, and this is the thing that keeps me up at night more than anything else. A um, couple of points is that you know, we have a comprehensive wastewater management plan that says we can only have so much wastewater discharge that's blown out of the water right now by a lot of different things happening. Um, we need to revisit that. Uh, Lori and I, I mean, Lori's a special guest next, but it, the benefit is I'm hanging around because I'm part of the internal water team looking at this. Yeah, we are looking at that, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, it, back of the envelope and you know I've asked Lori for this and you know, we're looking at another 50 to 60 million dollars over the next five years that the town is going to have to expend on both wastewater and uh, water in terms of meeting what our current requirements are not even getting into what our future requirements are so you know this is something that I've been advocating that it's a frustration I have with the Healy administration is that you know you're requiring that we create X amount of number of housing, but 
I don't have water to flush the toilets in this housing. So we have to have some, you know, communication with respect to that. The amount of students in the schools, I mean, I get mixed messages. I, I've spoke to the superintendent of school. He tells me that enrollment was down post-COVID. Statistically, and, and, and this is just a national statistic that when we're talking about creating the type of housing we are for young professionals or seniors that want to age in place, leave their single family home and go into 55 and older, there's basically one student for every 57 units of housing that you're creating. So it's not that big of an increase. I, I'm not going to say that that's a complete and accurate science, but I think it's a well-founded concern to say, are we going to overburden the schools? We don't know that. We're going to have to respond to that. But my more immediate concern is infrastructure, water and sewer today. Whether we add any new housing or not, we already know we have those issues. So how do we pay for that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hamilton. All right. Any other committee members? Okay, not hearing any at this time. You know, it's interesting, just a little aside here. We, we were just talking about students and schools, um, you know, and it, we wouldn't actually be talking just potential impact for uh, the Bridgewater Raynham district, uh, but we'd also be talking about a potential impact for Bristol Plymouth, um, for Bristol Aggie. <laughs> you know, the students in this town uh, do go to other schools uh, besides just here, but that's just a thought on the top of my head. Not hearing any other questions. If it will be the pleasure of the committee, we can move on. Sure. Okay, let's do that. Thank you again, Mr. Ruley. Very informative. Uh, you know, I think it was Rig that brought it up. You know, most of us uh, community members that know that we're on the finance committee, uh, we do get a lot of questions. I'm sure uh, I know I do. Uh, so it's definitely great to be knowledgeable uh, when those questions are posed to you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, order O FY twenty four dash zero one zero loan authorization for water well number five replacement. Uh, Lori, would you like to get us started? Or I see we have uh, Ms. Helen Gordon here. Um, would she like to start? Yes. Yeah, so let me introduce um, Helen Gordon. So she is our um, consultant for our DPW. Department uh, runs the work, roadway, environmental partners has, has been our OPM on our water treatment plants, currently our OPM on wastewater treatment plant, and we actually engaged them to help us with our um, hydraulic modeling, which is the infrastructure that Mr. Ruley was referring to. So. Um, I will let Helen take it away. But these two orders actually before you are for two um, well drones, and she'll go through why we need them and why we're going to go forward with them right now. So, Helen? Thank you, Lori. Um, if I might, Mr. Chair, through you? Yes, please. Helen Gordon, Environmental Partners. I'm a principal of Environmental Partners and have been working, as Lori said, with the DPW. I do wanna say that one of the things that um, we have been doing recently is making sure that all the work we do flanges up with the um, plans for the community now and in the future. So making sure that any capital improvements look to what the future need might be and make sure that we are doing things cost effectively to cover today and tomorrow. And um, we've had numerous um, strategy meetings with Mr. Ruley and others on that to make sure that that occurs. Um, these two um, items in front of you today are, revolve around your existing wells. So there are two wells right now that um, they are um, have reached their life expectancy. So wells typically once they're 
dug and uh, the pumps are put in and they're operated. Uh, every so every year you do cleaning and then every so many years you tend to have to redevelop the well to get it back to the capacity that it was before. Well nine and well 5A. So well nine is associated with the high street water treatment plant um, that flows to that plant now. Uh, and well 5A is a carver's pond well, which flows to that plant for both plants providing iron and manganese removal. Each of those wells are fairly old um, and they've been redeveloped over the last two to three years, every year. In the last two years, they haven't rebounded to the original capacity. So you're in a situation where you have a withdrawal permit where you can withdraw more than what's coming out of them, um, but you can't redevelop this well anymore. So what has to happen is you have to replace the well and it's within the same area. Um, we try to do it within 50 feet diameter of the, at 50 feet um, from the existing well. So it will be located in the general area. Um, according to Mass DEP regulations, the first aspect of the work is to do some inspectional drilling find an adequate supply location and then order a screen and put the screen in. And then the next phase is to design the pumps and install the pumps and connect up the SCADA system to operate the pumps in the new well to each of the treatment plants. So that's the project as a whole. A more estimating each of them right now each replacement for all the work to be um, upset limit of $1 million. And again, the reason these need to be done is because this is just to maintain your current capacity that you have for wells. This isn't adding additional capacity to your system. Um, there have been some issues with keeping the standpipes full during high demand periods to the point where we're over pumping. Um, and I say we, because I feel like I'm in this with, with the community as I work with you every day and Jonas and Zoo and Caleb, we're at the point where we're pumping the wells um, almost all 24 hours and that's really not good for the other wells. So we really need to supplement with this nine and five A and get them back to producing what they were producing previously. And I'll leave it at that, um, Mr. Chair, if there's any questions, um, if I can answer them, I will try. <laughs> okay, well, one quick question that I do have, uh, what, is the, um, what, what is the difference uh, with the utilization of the capacity? on those wells right now? Is it 10% underutilized because we can't get the capacity out or? So right now you're looking at, um, just let me look at my numbers over here. So I'm gonna pull this up here. We are currently, So well nine has a daily average pumping rate of 0.13. And we're at the point where we're around down about 30%. And that's just not what you wanna see on a pump. And as I said, that pump has been redeveloped within the last, um, just within the last year alone. So every year you're losing a little more and a little more. And where we stand right now with water demands, 
um, during your peak periods in the summertime, that's when we struggle to keep the um, elevated tanks full, which is you need to keep those, uh, excuse me, the stand pipes full in order to maintain the pressure in the distribution system. There's a minimum required pressure that you need to maintain throughout the system. That's 35 PSI according to um, Mass DEP um, public water supply regulations. Okay, thank you. Yes. Do we have uh, any questions from the committee? I have you a question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Rick, please. Thank you. Um, hi, Helen, how are you? Um, good evening. Good evening. I would like to know um, if if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly, the previous um, action that was done to address this was to repair. This is a complete replacement. Can you can you tell us um, what was spent previously to to repair? Um, these two wells and how and how much did I frame that correctly? What how much <laughs> was spent previously and how many times? So I would have to um, defer to the town on that. So the re the re the redevelopment versus replacement. The redevelopment of the well is has been done by Mar um, on I think an annual basis. So. I could tell you the dates that they've done it, but I don't, they were directly contracted with the town um, and I don't have those records. Okay, so, I'm sorry, continue. I, I do have a couple of follow-up questions, but please continue. Um, so I could, it would take me a minute to pull up the dates, but I could do that if you want me to do that. The, oh, oh, go ahead, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I was going to say, I was going to suggest uh, it may be best if we want some numbers, uh, we could get those probably from Lori, um, and then she could uh, share those with the board, uh, the committee later on. Yep, thank you. Days. Does that work? Okay. All yeah, right. Which, which I, other question? I do have a follow-up question. Um, <laughs> maybe I'll frame these two questions together. How many total wells are in Bridgewater, and how many of them... Uh, <laughs> has either been replaced and or repaired. And the reason why I'm asking these questions is um you know I'm I'm trying to see you know I'm trying to understand will we be in this position again next year or the year or, or the year after looking to replace something that was repaired multiple times. Right. So All good questions. Um, all wells are typically redeveloped, have to be redeveloped on a consistent basis, whether that be to every three years, um, it really depends on the well itself. And typically, um, so Mar, who does your, who has been doing your redevelopment is um, very experienced in this area. They're very familiar with the town's work, the town wells. And they actually um, did mention to the town that now's the time to, there's no point in spending any more money on the redevelopment at this point in time. We haven't seen, I haven't seen any records on the others that indicate that we would need to be doing any replacement within the next year or so, but I can't guarantee that, obviously. Um, we don't know if a screen fails, um, then that would have to be replaced. So there might be some work that has to be done with them, but not a replacement per se. So the replacement per se happens when you really aren't continuing to get the capacity that you're expecting. And these two in particular um, are down a larger percentage. I would have to look at, and I haven't done it in detail. So I'd have to look at the other ones and look at the results of the redevelopment 
that has been done to try to um, predict if we think in the next year or so um, there continue there has been a problem with the redevelopment and there, that might be needed. Um, right now, there are four wells associated with the High Street Water Treatment Plant. And those wells collectively are given a withdrawal permit of 1.62 million gallons a day. Um, so that we definitely want to maintain the operations of those wells. I haven't seen any indication that three, six, or eight are in eminent need of replacement. Um, Carver's Pond, each of those wells have separate, there's four operational wells at Carver's Pond, and each of them has their own maximum daily withdrawal rate identified by the state that you're permitted for. Um, and right now, it looks like, I'm just looking at the others for a moment. I can't tell from this information what the redevelopment has been done on all the others other than 5A. And then you do have um, two wells off of Plymouth Street. Uh, they are have been off since um, it's 10A and 10B, and they've been down due to water quality issues. Um, they just have well houses and chemical addition. There isn't a treatment plant associated with iron and manganese, and they've been two wells that really don't um, produce very good quality water. So they haven't been used um, for a while now. Thank you so much. Hey, Mr. You. Chairman, if, if I yeah, could, if I could just add to what sure. Ms. Gordon said and uh, address Mr. Noel's question. Uh, future infrastructure is a huge concern for, for the community. And we have two wells that have been uh, dug at on Vernon, uh, on Vernon Street. Uh, if we were to bring those online, that's going to require a... Uh, treatment plant. Um, so there are a number of options that we're looking at. But when I look at infrastructure, uh, I try to engage people on this as more of a regional issue than just a town of Bridgewater issue. And we need to continue to have those conversations. But I, I think that going forward, we're somewhat satisfied that we can meet the requirements of the community in terms of water and sewer but there's an expense associated with that. And we need to be ahead of what that expense is. And that's what you know, vision reality is addressing some of that, but that's why we have this internal uh, committee now that Helen is part of, I'm part of, uh, Jonas is part of, Azu is part of, in terms of, let's make sure we're way ahead of this in terms of, making sure we're not caught flat-footed with respect to some of these issues. But again, you know, creating another treatment plan at Vernon Street, those aren't small ticket items. I mean, and, and those are things that we need to be preparing for. Uh, it's great to say you have the water, but we have to treat the water. And we're seeing that with respect to PFAS, uh, which is something no one even talked about 10 years ago, that there are increasing concerns with how we deal with that. And there is a big disconnect between what the federal requirements are and what the realistic requirements of these things are. And that hasn't been resolved. So infrastructure is the one thing that keeps me up at night in everything that I do in my world. Thank you both. Really Dave. appreciate your response. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, Lori, I have a question for you. Um, as I look at the load uh, order here, 
uh, are we looking at two different financing sources? I, I see issue bonds and notes. And then the next line, I see borrow all or a portion of the amount from Massachusetts Clean Water Trust. So uh, you're on mute, Lori. Sorry, I'm like tapping away. I didn't want to disturb <laughs> um, So they're both each priced at a million dollars each, and we're applying for MCWT loans that will be repaid with um, water. I'm sorry, you broke up. They're repaid with what? Um, from the water fund. Okay. So we, we intend, we, we are anticipating that we would borrow the, the full amount from the Massachusetts Clean Water Trust. Is that correct? Yep, that's the yes. Okay. Uh, would, what would be the cost of that money be to the town? Well, we are still in the financing stage of it. We're, that's what the loan in front of you is we're going to borrow up to a million dollars. So obviously if we uh, qualify for any grants or sometimes different programs, emergency infrastructure, things like that, we're aggressively looking for any of that that would reduce any kind of, that would save the town and the taxpayers and the uh, money. So we we always, uh, we authorize to borrow, meaning we can begin the project, go find the money that we need to to complete the project. Okay, but there is a cost to the town for borrowing the money, correct? I'm sure. Yeah, there's always a cost, but that cost is included as part of the project. So we're looking for like a zero percent or one and a half percent interest loan. So, okay. Yeah, that that's more what I was looking for, Lori. Thank I'm sorry. you. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I've had a long Monday. I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Questions, comments, thoughts? Okay, not hearing any, the chair will entertain a motion on this order. Motion to approve. Thank you, MJ. Second. Thank you, Rig. Josh, if you could do a roll call for us, please. Nate. Aye. Julie. Aye. MJ. Aye. Rig. Aye. Steve. Aye. Jim. Aye. Thank you, the motion was approved. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, moving on to the next order of business is FY24-001, uh, loan authorization, water well number nine replacement. Um, we kind of just discussed the both of these together here. Do we have any additional questions? Motion to approve. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, is that you, MJ, in a second? Yes, it was. Okay, thank you. Josh, if you could do a roll call, please. Nate. Aye. Julie. Aye. Rig. Aye. MJ. Aye. Steve. Aye. Jim. Aye. Thank you. The motion was approved. All right. Thank you, everyone. And a very big thank you to uh, Mr. Rooley and Ms. Gordon also for joining us this evening. Um, been very informative, uh, and we do truly appreciate your time in joining us. Absolutely. Good night, Mr. Chair and the rest of the committee. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, moving on, we have one final order of business. Um, back in, what was it, July, we were supposed to do a reorganization, which pretty much means uh, pick uh, our chair and our vice chair for the next upcoming year. Uh, before we kick off the conversation, one thing I'd like to say, too, uh, for the newer members is that the chair cannot make any motions. No motions can come from the chair. So if you hear silence from me, uh, from the chair, it's just because I can't. Um, so just to start off real quick, you know, I've been on the committee who eight years now, maybe more. I'm going on my third year as the chair. Uh, if it's the pleasure of this committee, I'd be more than willing to serve one more year as the chair. Um, but I'm hoping that we begin the progression of me stepping back. Um, so our current vice chair is Eric Langone. Uh, for you that don't know him, he was actually the chair of this committee for, geez, I don't know, four or five years maybe. 
Um, but his, his job uh, has led him in a different direction a little bit. Um, so I, I haven't heard from him. I, I, I would assume that we probably want to look uh, in a new direction for our, uh, our, our vice chair, uh, if it is the pleasure that I'm the chair again for one more year. All right, so that, that, that being said, <laughs> I will open it up for anybody that would like to be the chair or the vice chair. Mr. Chairman, I would like to offer up my volunteering to be chair of the committee. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, so what happens here if we have two people, um, somebody makes a motion and then we have a vote. Nathan, you said you were still interested. So how would it work if I nominated you even though MJ just put in a nomination? Like, do we vote one at a time? Would we vote? Yeah, there would be a motion. Well, That's how we've done in the past. Am I wrong with that, Josh? No, you're, you're correct. And uh, MJ would need a motion for you guys to vote. Well, we can have a motion for either one of us, right? Is that how we do it? Right. Okay. And just for party purposes, are we voting for both remaining chair or chair and uh, vice chair? No, just, just for the chair for the next upcoming year until next uh, July, end of next July. Yep. Right, Josh? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, we need a motion. <laughs> I Obviously, I can't motion and MJ can't motion. All right, I'll make, I'll make the motion to vote for the next chairperson. But you have to pick a person yeah, to nominate. Yeah, yeah. Motion right. to retain Nate as the current chair. Okay, and we would need a second. I'll, I'll second that. Okay, a second from Steve. Thank you. And now we would do a roll call. Okay, Nate. Uh, I abstain. You, you can actually vote on it if you'd like. I can. Yep. I, I don't know. I'll abstain, I guess. Okay. Um, Julie? Aye. Rig? Aye. MJ? Same. Steve? Aye. Jim? Aye. Thank you. The motion was approved. All right. Thank you, everyone. All right, moving on to um, our next position, uh, vice chair for the upcoming year that will end at the end of July 2024. Correct, Josh? Yep. Okay. Anybody that would like to fill that role? Mr. Chairman, I'll volunteer to be vice chair. Okay, thank you. Motion to vote MJ as vice chair. Second. Make... Yeah. All right, I think Steve was, Rig was first, Steve was second. If you could do a roll call, please. Nate. Aye. Julie. Aye. Rig. Aye. MJ. Uh, am I able to vote for myself or? Yep. Aye. Yes. Steve. Aye. Jim. Aye. Thank you. The motion was approved. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, you know, I I'm happy. Um, I, I think that we're heading in the right direction. Uh, I'm excited to work with uh, MJ moving forward uh, with the upcoming year, uh, and hopefully people will start maybe thinking about next year too, <laughs> which would be nice. I'd like to, I, I definitely, I think I'd like to spend my last year kind of cruising <laughs> into the sunset. But anyways, thank you very much. Uh, we've already had a long evening. Uh, does have anybody else have anything to add? I just want to. So add when we mentioned next year, we would be be voting in in July next year. It'd be, be July twenty twenty four. Yeah, that's when. Right, Josh, is that when we're supposed to? Yeah, it's just um, it's it, it's it's not it's not mandatory, um, but it's good to just get a rotation going. That way, there you know everyone's getting the experience. That's right. Um, that's so right. it's very we can revisit in July and. If everybody's happy with the current setup or somebody wants to um, volunteer for chair, we can uh, look at it then. Okay, great. Yeah, I know traditionally in the past, didn't we, wasn't it like November, MJ, I see you were second. Wasn't that when we kind yeah. of did that stuff? It, it used to be that we did this in November. We try to do it as close to 
July as possible. But when I was still secretary, it usually ended up being we had summer break. Then we would have a couple of times we wouldn't have quorum in September, which is sort of yeah kind of par for the course for us. And then we would vote on it in November. And I want to say it was like usually for a bit longer than a year. We we usually opted to reorganize after maybe the the end of the term of the chair on the committee, but that was way back in our early wild, wild west days when we had Gary Ullman as chair. So <laughs> yeah. we we could afford to have someone be chair for three fiscal years. And, you know, that was pretty much it. But now that we're on a consistent pattern of a ro rotating chairmanship yeah. on at least a yearly yeah. basis, but then reaffirmed each time through, um, it seems to be we've done it pretty much just about close to near July. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I, because I know when it happened, for, it was November, and it was, geez, it was awful close to the kickoff of budget season, and it, it was hitting the ground sprinting. So I think it's better to do it uh, late summer, early fall, uh, before and, before the craziness starts. Okay. Right, thank I, you. I have one more question on that. Josh, are you able to provide us with when the termination dates are for the current people? Like yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's actually available on uh, the town's website as well. Mm -hmm. um, hey, but I'm happy to email it to you. Great. You know, Josh, one thing too that's on the top of my head. I'm not mm -hmm. talking about the what the town manager or the uh, town hall was trying to do as far as um the ethics. Mm -hmm. Uh but could you just send the link uh for the ethics class to the, the committee when you have a second? Um because I know there's some sort of link when that when there's when you're you're supposed to take the, the state's uh conflict of interest. Oh and, yeah, yeah, I can send yeah, that out. And, yeah, and there is that state one that we all take. If you can just send it re back, send it back out to the committee, um, I would greatly appreciate it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. Okay. That being said, anything else? Just okay. that we're going to continue to have the meetings via Zoom, correct? Oh yeah. So our next meeting, just real quick before we do our favorite motion. Um, Let's see here. Uh, so our next meeting would be the 16th. Is that correct, Josh? Um, When's the town council meet again? Uh, next Tuesday. So, yeah, we would be looking at the 16th. The 16th. Okay, great. And Julie, and just to, to answer your question regarding virtual, um, we are working on hybrid right now. Um, we haven't gotten all the details but um we're hoping to roll out hybrid within the next couple months so right now it's still virtual but it, it but uh hybrid is uh in our sites right now for the finance committee or for other committees or all are we the only ones that are still no nope. every committee the town council is the only um in-person meeting right now every school all committee too are but virtual. i know they're a different entity yeah okay thank you yep, thank you Thank you, Julie. Okay, so we're looking to um, the 16th for our next meeting. That's after Columbia. Okay, that's good. All right. Uh, any other motions? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, MJ. Second. Second. Okay, thank you, Ray. Uh, Josh, if we could do a roll call. Nate. Aye. Julie. Aye. Rig. Aye. MJ. Aye. Steve. Aye. Jim. Aye. Thank you. The motion was approved. Meeting adjourned. Okay. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Hey, hey, MJ. Yes, Nate. Hey, can you do me a favor? Can you just send me your uh, text number real quick? Sure, email? of course. Just so you I can, if we need to get in yeah. touch uh, last second. Okay. Thank you. Good night, all. Thank you. Thank you, okay. everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.